want to give you a little color background of our speaker today, Mark uh, McLaughlin. Mark and I came from the same town, Philadelphia, only I'm told I have a Philadelphia accent, and he doesn't. So I suppose you lost it in the West. He left William Penn and real cheesesteaks, people. These are real cheesesteaks in Philadelphia. To come uh, to Northern uh, California. And he, in 1978, he came here to discover the wonders of North Lake Tahoe and has since become a renowned historian of the Sierra Nevada. Mark is an award-winning, nationally published author and photographer with six books and more than six articles in print. He was educated as a historian and a cultural geographer at the University of Nevada, Reno, and his work appears regularly in the California and Nevada media. He has received the Nevada State Press Award five times. And he is a frequent guest on national public radio, has appeared on CNN, the History Channel, and the Weather Channel. We were fortunate to have Mark with us about a year ago uh, to enlighten us on the Donner, Donner Party, Weathering the Storm. Uh, and he was kind enough to accept our invitation to come back today and tell us about Lake Tahoe, stories, facts, and fun and he knows all about it. So please hold all of your questions till the end of the presentation, and let's give Mark a warm Sun City welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. We didn't come out of Philadelphia together. <laughs> um, well, let's just jump into it. What I put together was it's a, like a very broad, overarching look at Tahoe's history in a sense, but I'd like to focus on some key events, some key characters, and early pioneers. Uh, kind of gives us an overarching look at uh, what the big story is uh, for the uh, Lake Tahoe region. Um, moving forward, I'd like to start off and acknowledge the Washoe Indians have had a presence there since the end of the last ice age. We think about 9,000 years ago. They would uh, spend the winters down in what is today Nevada in the high desert, and then in the summer after the snow melted, they would come up to the mountains, they could fish and hunt, and collect the roots and plants for medicinal purposes and things of that nature. And uh, Lake Tahoe was a very important spiritual center for them. The Washoe women were very well known for their basket weaving skills. Uh, there was this one woman, Datso Lali, who ended up uh, marrying an American man. They had a little retail store where the outlet of Lake Tahoe is. There's a dam there now. And she, this is like 1910, 1920, and she would sell baskets to tourists coming into town for the, the summer months. And even then, her baskets could be $300, $400, some of them. Now they run closer to $40,000 for some of these nice specimens. She did one particular basket, which, I mean, out of all the baskets, there's very remarkable, but the one that really kind of caught my attention the most was this basket that she wove with her hands using split blades of grass and reeds. And this basket is so small, it's displayed in the bottom of a test tube with a magnifying glass in front of it and a halogen light shining on it so you can kind of peer and actually see it. I figured the only reason you make a basket like that is to challenge yourself with your dexterity. If I can make them this big, how small can I actually make them? But uh, Datso Lali is one of the more uh, noted of the uh, early basket weavers. Uh, Lake Tahoe, a lot of people think, you know, and look at that place, it kind of looks like it could have been an ancient volcano. Kind of comes out looking a little bit uh, oval and surrounded with mountains. It's, it kind of gives you the sense of like Crater Lake up there in Oregon. Uh, the thing is that Lake Tahoe pretty much formed when we have the land uplifting during these very active, robust tectonic periods, and it starts to fracture, and as mountain ranges pop up, the land in between collapses and sinks. And Tahoe's the beginning, they call that uh, basin and range, or Horst and Graben, but it's mountain basin, mountain basin, and Tahoe's the beginning of it, and it goes all the way across Nevada into Utah. Tahoe just happens to be filled with water. And what happened, uh, let's see if I can pull out my, um, 
laser pointer real fast here, see if it makes a difference. Uh, if you can see over here, the western margin of Lake Tahoe would be the Sierra uplifting, and then the Carson Range is to the east. Both of these mountain ranges kind of fuse together, and then the mountain range heads south, and you get into the real high country down by Yosemite uh, towards Mount Whitney and all the really highest peaks. The open end of this basin, this um, collapsed interior, was sealed off by volcanic activity about two to three million years ago. And then it was over time with uh, different climates and now our annual amounts of precipitation that fills the lake, it brings it up about three feet, it evaporates three feet, comes up about three, based on a normal cycle. Any water droplet, the way they try to explain this is any water droplet that comes in through precipitation or snow melt from the watershed around into the lake, it takes around 700 years for it to either go out the spillway of the Tahoe Dam, the only outlet, or much more likely to evaporate because the evaporation level is much greater than whatever comes out of those little 17 gates. And if you get up there this summer, you'll see, and it's not super unusual, but you'll see that the lake is low and there is no water spilling into the Truckee River at this time. Uh, the word in, in the neighborhood now is this is the worst drought that we've ever had. In 1992, the lake was three feet lower than it is right now. So if you don't count up to 20 years ago, then you're right. It is the worst drought of record. Uh, but I'm not the, today it feels like history starts today kind of a thing in the media and everything. So I'm that guy that's like, no, I was kind of here before and I've seen it worse. But suffice it to say, it's dry up there. Uh, we credit a guy, a topographical engineer, a guy named John Fremont, with coming in. He was exploring the west, he was making maps, and he came through the area. Uh, he was coming down the eastern part of the Sierra, and at one point they realized as they're running out of food, there it's December of 1843 into January of 1844, they need to cross the Sierra to get down to Sacramento Sutter's Fort, Swiss National, who had started a, a fort and an economy down there, and they wanted to get down there for resupply. They ended up crossing the Sierra in the dead of winter. The weather was quite nice. They really lucked out in that. I'm not going to say it was easy, but all these 30 men survived this trek, and it was on Valentine's Day that uh, John Fremont and his cartographer, a German artist, a guy named Charles Price, they climbed the mountain to get a sense of their bearings. They looked to the north, and this is the view that they had on the right-hand side there of looking at Lake Tahoe. They had seen a lot of mar marvelous things so far in this trip. They were, you know, 20 miles away, but they still remarked at how beautiful the lake was. And Fremont, particularly as a geographer, found it very compelling that it looked like this massive lake just suspended high up in the, in the mountains in a way that you would not normally see it. And it does have that kind of uh, impact on a lot of people. We also credit this gentleman and a few others, but uh, Elijah Stevens and the mountain man that accompanied him, Caleb Greenwood. These gentlemen are bringing a party of 50 people with 11 wagons trying to get over the Sierra and into California. They're going to use the Humboldt River over what is today northern Nevada. They connect with the Truckee River. They follow both of these water courses to eventually what they hit would be Donner Pass, cross the mountains, and they all reach California. It takes them 11 months from start to finish, and they do get everybody in, and two babies are born along the way. So this was a very successful trip. It's the very first one of any group to bring wagons into the Sierra. It's often overshadowed because just two years later, we had the party, the Donner group that came through. They suffered a lot more. They suffered a quite a bit of death, and of course there was the cannibal issue. And that overshadowed the Stevens effort, and everything is now named for Donners, Donner Lake, Donner Pass, all this. Instead, we should have had some more things for Elijah Stevens and his group to honor what they did. They did go right up that Truckee River Canyon, which is where Interstate 80 runs along when you're heading down to Reno. This was the only group that ever did it. The uh, canyon itself was very rocky. There would not be much water because there was no dam. So what happens, you have all your spring snow melt coming down, the lake will go up, the river will run very strongly. Then as the, everything settles down by the late summer, early fall, the lake would have come down to its natural rim and stopped feeding in. So there wouldn't be a strong flow, but the water that pooled in these, between the rocks softened the oxen's hooves and made them split, and these oxen were going lame, and they decided the very next year uh, to blaze a new trail and detour around. And it does require effort. It takes, adds miles to the trip, but nobody ever, after the Stevens party, ever ended up uh, using the canyon itself. 
We uh, credit uh, this gentleman on the left, uh, Chief Truckee, with man that helped open the California Trail because Stevens Party gets the end of the Humboldt River. There's a very broad desert in front of them. Today we call it the 40 mile desert. They didn't know what to do. Chief Truckee, who as a teenager had had visions of the white man being a benevolent long lost brother. He had a concept, it's a biblical idea in, a, in many ways in my opinion. It's, there was this early family and, um, of different colors, the children, and the great spirit saw them bickering and he sent the whites away and the Indians stayed local, and now the whites were coming back. So these are long lost people from our early history. Chief Truckee was very supportive of the white man, despite the uh, things that start to make issues and agitation and tension later on. These were the very first wagons, and they were just coming through and keeping on going, which is what all the other Indians wanted to see. It's like, hi, you guys, just see you later. Uh, but it's when they started to come and stay again is when the problems really uh, became an issue. The Stevens party ended up, Chief Truckee had said, yeah, cross that mountain, you'll get to California, right? And they said, well, all right, that sounds good. Well, Chief Truckee had never tried to get a wagon over there. So this group ends up taking about five of those 11 wagons, taking them apart, holding them up in pieces, and eventually getting everything to the top where they finally get over the mountains, but then get caught in snow and get stuck there for a while, which makes that 11 month trip. After they tried to do that, and the subsequent year that people tried to do the same thing, and they realized this is way too hard. We have to improve the trail. And ultimately, they opened up what we call Roller Pass, which is uh, a little bit further south of where Donner Pass is. And instead of having up the cliffs with the straight perpendicular face, you would go up this very steep incline and the oxen would be at the top with ropes and chains connected all the way down to the bottom of the slope where the wagon was, and it pulled it up that way. It was the chains and the ropes being over, being dragged over logs that they put there to protect it from dragging in the rock that we call it roller pass, as the, rocks would, uh, the logs would uh, roll along. There was a couple people, I'm gonna jump back to that real fast. We have uh, two 18-year-old kids in this group, Alan and Sarah Montgomery. They're farm kids from back in Ohio area. Neither of them had any education. Very young, of course, just got married. They're coming out on this lark, you know, coming out to a very primitive area in many ways. It was still a Mexican province. There were very few American people here. There was no industry, nothing like that. Uh, but ultimately, they were on a sense of adventure as two young newlyweds. And uh, Sarah Montgomery is going to have an interesting story. Um, when they get down to California, this is in 1845, when they finally get in, we are just going to be ramping up the very next year to the breakout of the Mexican-American War. Bear Flag Revolt comes out of Sonoma, and um, Allen jumps immediately into fighting, fighting for the American side. After a couple of years of that, of course, the war is over by 1848, and he decides that he doesn't want to be married to Sarah anymore. He wants a life of adventure. And he says, honey, love you. It's been great. I'm going to Hawaii. Aloha. And he sets off for the, uh, for the islands. Now, uh, Sarah is going to be on her own. And eventually, she's learning uh, to read and write with the other little kids who in this little school at Sutter's Fort. So she eventually becomes literate and everything. And she starts to get this very voracious uh, appetite for reading and learning more and more and more. And she moves to San Francisco. She's in San Francisco. She's a single woman. We're not really sure if she got divorced or not, but suffice it to say, the other guy's not coming back. So she's going to be moving forward with her life. And she meets uh, this guy, Talbot Green. Talbot Green lives in San Francisco. Very successful businessman. Been there for a while. In fact, he came out in 1841 with the very first party that tried to bring wagons to California, but failed. The group itself walked in with some pack animals, but they were not able to bring any wagons in. Since they did not do that, they did not open the California Trail. Because if anybody's going to come on a route of that length, you need to bring everything you own with you. Anyway, she runs into this guy. They start seeing each other, and eventually they get married. They have a child. They figure this looks good. He's got a beautiful house in San Francisco. And he decides, because he's very popular and everything, he says, I want to run for mayor. 
of San Francisco. Well, by now, it's in the early 1850s. There's a ton of people that had come out for the gold rush. It wasn't just this little isolated place anymore. And he's out there on the stump, you know, trying to get the electorate to go for him and everything. And then there was enough people that had showed up that said, you know what? We know this guy. His name is Paul Gaggs. He actually robbed the bank in Pennsylvania, <laughs> abandoned his family, and came out west. And that's how he had all this money. And the fact was, when he came out in the 1841 wagon train, and eventually they lose their wagons, they have to just basically carry the most uh, crucial things, you know, some water, some food, and this, that, and the other, none of their heavy stuff. He had this very heavy rucksack. And they're like, what do you got in that thing? And he says, I'm carrying lead, because when I get to California, I'm going to cast the lead into bullets and sell them which would have been a very good idea, but the fact is it was a bunch of gold coins and everything that he had in there, never abandoned it, of course, and that's how he became such a very successful businessman and, and before the gold rush kicked in. Anyway, everybody says, well, you know, you're a great guy, we'd love to vote you for mayor, but you're a fugitive on the lam. And he says, well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go back to Pennsylvania and I'm gonna clear my name and then I'll come back. And Sarah's like, okay, honey, we'll see you. And the uh, fact is, he never comes back. He does send her money to raise that son that they had. And here she is, was an illiterate young girl as she came out to California, ends up marrying this guy, you know, kind of the criminal type. But he sends her the money, they raise that kid, and he becomes one of California's state librarians, which is kind of interesting. And the other thing is, the kid, takes Talbot Green's name, even though it wasn't even a real name. It was an alias. So that's our little story about our state librarian. And Sarah goes on. Now this is her second husband that's kind of jumped ship. So finally she meets this guy, Joe Wallace. First he was an attorney. She encourages to move forward. He gets, into, gets a judgeship. And then he becomes a state senator. This is the house that they lived. They built down there near Palo Alto. And ultimately, uh, she became one of California's most noted political activist and feminist. She was always pushing an agenda for women. This is, the house itself burnt down, and unfortunately we have no photographs of Sarah, despite all the things that she had done and the people that she met. This is the historic plaque, and there's a few names of people that came and visited her salon and came to her meetings and everything. You've got Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, some guy named Ulysses Grant, you know, I know sometimes when I speak to certain groups, it's like, who are these people? But really, they were very important people in the 19th century. And she is able, she doesn't make it to when the, the women's right for suffragette goes federal for the whole country, but she's able to, at least for California, get women the, uh, the right to own the title to land, go to state college, and to practice law. These were all accomplishments that she did moving forward once she arrived here. Now, we, oh, most of us are pretty familiar with the gold rush. Uh, January 1848, we just signed the treaty with Mexico, and then the next thing you know, and I'm sure the Mexicans are going, what just happened here? First of all, we get into this war that they really weren't prepared for. The Americans win, they lose all of this land, and most importantly, California. That was the jewel that the United States was looking for. And then, almost immediately, some guy finds all this gold and now you've got 100,000 people running out and everybody seems to be getting rich. So Mexico was a little bit steamed about all that, I'm sure. And, you know, we have this mother load here on the Sierra West Slope with all these various mines and things. It went over, well over 200 miles north to south. But subsequent to that, 10 years later, we've got a gold and mostly silver strike out what becomes to Virginia City. Because just a few years after this gold rush has kicked in, you know, people are coming out and they're thinking they're still going to get rich, but it wasn't like that anymore. Most of the good stuff had already been taken. The easy pickings were done. You had to organize into large groups. It wasn't for small individual efforts anymore. And ultimately, they're going to be moving into hydraulic and then hard rock mining. So this whole idea of coming out with my mule, my pick, and my shovel, I'm going to be a millionaire. The days were gone. But once the rush to Washoe kicks in, is what they call this silver strike out here in Virginia City, Everybody started going the other way, and that is where we start getting all the settlement. That also wasn't for individuals either, because that was really deep mining that required armies of men, huge amounts of capital, capital and a, a heavy dose of equipment to do all of this digging out from 
one to 3,000 feet below the surface. But suffice it to say, the, gold, the silver strike did pan out to be one of the greatest silver uh, hits in the history of the world. Ultimately, we have all these people that had come through western Nevada. Now they're starting to come back. And this is where we start getting into the issue with the Paiute Indians. They, the main focus for the Paiute Nation in what is today western Nevada was Pyramid Lake. That is the terminus of the Truckee River. That totally makes sense because you've got Nevada, it's the driest state of all 50 states, and it's desert country. There's not a lot of large game. I mean, there's rabbits and there's rodents and there's things out there, but the fact is you're going to have all this fish in Pyramid Lake. And these Indians had the greatest bone stature of all the Great Basin Indians because they had such a reliable source of protein. Well, now you've got these men coming in to settle around the Comstock, and we're going to have more and more and more guys. They're going to come into the best areas. They're going to come in where the bottomlands are, where the water is. The Indians can't go there anymore. The Indians relied, one of the staples of their food was the pinion nut, and they would cut it. They would harvest these pine nuts. They would ground them out. They would um, make tortillas and different things and thicken soups and different uh, food sources like that, and it was a very good staple for them. Well, it takes about 90 years for one of these trees to grow to the point where it starts to produce the nut. And then when the men come in, the settlers come in and they want the wood, there's only certain places you're going to get wood in a dry area like that, they're cutting down all the pine nuts. So the Indians are now complaining that they're cutting down our orchards. And so they see the writing on the wall particularly the young men. They are the ones really getting agitated about this, and there's no reason why they shouldn't. This is Pyramid Lake, and the fact is, it was, um, once again, John Fremont who named it, and it's a name that sticks, because when he saw this triangular-shaped rock, pyramid-shaped rock, that was what gave him the inspiration to call it Pyramid Lake. Now, we've got all these young men that are gaming for a fight. Well, we've got Chief Truckee. He's going to be the old guy. He's the leader of the group. And he says, don't do it. The white men are good for us. They're going to help us. And Truckee had these ideas, well, they're going to introduce you know, weapons for us, and that will make hunting easier. And, and, the new, and the technologies that these Americans had, the Indians, who were very impoverished, they were thinking, yeah, this would be great, but it's not going to go that route for them. And we have over on the right-hand side is Chief Winnemucca. That is Truckee's son. And Winnemucca is much more pragmatic. Truckee's being delusional now, in my opinion, and he's going to end up dying at the end of 1860 after this particular conflict that's going to come up. But he goes to his grave believing that the white man is great, despite all these things that are happening, even at the end of his life. So the thing that uh, Chief Winnemucca said was, I'm not, I don't think these guys are good for us. They're coming, they're taking our land, our ancestral land. But the fact is, there's so many of them, I don't think we can fight them off. So he was kind of resigned to just being at peace. But the thing that puts everything over the top is in the spring of 1860, we have these three brothers, the Williams brothers. They have this trading post outside Virginia City. Well, it turns out that there were two young Indian girls, about 12 years old, from the tribe, who just kind of disappeared. Kids don't disappear. And these Indians, there's about 20 of them, they're going around their search party, right? And they come up to the trading post and they come up to the two brothers. The third brother's out. The youngest brother is out doing something. He's away. They come up to the two brothers and said, have you seen a couple of young Indian girls? These guys are like, I don't know what you're talking about. We haven't seen anybody. Well, the Indians are going to have dogs with them. And the dogs either smell something or hear something, but they alert to this kind of a trap door. The, the Indians open up the trap door. The two girls are down there, bound and gagged in this cellar. So the Indians do what I don't have a problem with, actually. They free the girls, they kill the two brothers, and they burn the place down. Oh, that's what happens, right, when you uh, steal somebody's kids. But ultimately, the surviving brother comes back. He sees all the carnage, and he rides up into Virginia City, city saying, the Paiutes are on the war path. They're coming to get us. Well, there's a lot of people on the Comstock, and hundreds and hundreds of guys get together. They're all drinking beer and doing shots at the bar. And they're like, well, we're going to go out there, and we're going to teach those Indians a lesson. We're going to steal all their horses. We're going to do this, that, the other thing. Well, push comes to shove. When the day of the uh, movement, the attack on Pyramid Lake and the Indians comes about, only 105 guys show up. Well, these are men from various militias from the area. These militias are not there to fight Indians or protect the whites. They are there because we have 
the Civil War is really kicking in back east, and we have a lot of Confederate sympathizers, even though it was pro-Union for the most part in the West, in California and Nevada, there were plenty of Confederate sympathizers who were floating the flag and talking about insurrection, and these militias were going to be to put these guys down if it ever come to a fight. So these are the guys, and they feel like they got this military thing going, and they're going to be led by this guy named uh, Major Ormsby, William Ormsby. Ormsby is a veteran of the Free Booter Wars. There was a guy, an American guy named Walker, who went down to Nicaragua and with this idea of taking over large swaths of land by force and violence and convert it to an American-style democratic colony. Well, he does this for like 15 years until finally they catch him in Honduras and they execute him. Uh, but the fact is, Ormsby had been a couple of these um, uh, uh, battles with this guy, Walker, and so he had military experience. He had lost a leg, so he only has the one leg. Well, they get him on the horse, they tie him in pretty good, and he leads them up to Pyramid Lake. All right, well, they get up there, and they, as soon as they get up there, they don't see much going on, but they see about 30 Indians on horseback, but they're, at a dis, uh, they're kind of in a distance. So the, the guys are like, we got some, we got some. So they start riding, and they ride up onto that bluff that you see. And when they get up onto the bluff and they're running, you know, they're racing headlong in, they're like, well, where are those guys, you know? There's going to be all kinds of ravines and things. So those Indians just ducked out somewhere, and now the guys stop, and they're not sure what's going on. And all of a sudden, 600 Indians show up, pretty much circling them, and they all have rifles. These guys are mostly packing revolvers and shotguns. There was only a couple, two or three men that had weapons that would be effective at long range. So the Indians start shooting at these guys, and the men are like, wow, let's, what's going on here? We have no protection. we got to get out of here. And they raced off the bluff into where the Truckee River is there. You can see those cottonwood trees. They wanted to get into the trees and make a stand. Well, as they come down towards the trees, the Indians are there. They've been waiting for this whole thing to have it all set up. Now these guys are on a route, and their horses are being shot out from under them. They're falling off. They're running for their lives, and the Indians are just taking them down one by one. Well, ultimately, 76 of those 105 guys are killed. And the way I've read it, and I haven't really looked in to prove it, but I have read that that is the greatest. If you want to consider this a massacre, this was a vigilante. There was no law sank. This was not a legally sanctioned effort by these guys. It was strictly out of the streets. And that the, between the uh, French and Indian Wars and Custer's Last Stand, this would have been the one time in between those two uh, conflicts where we saw this many whites killed in one particular battle. The men are running and running and running, the militiamen are running, and it was only because darkness came that these final guys were able to survive. And uh, here we have Ormsby down here. He's, you know, he knew some of the Indian chiefs and everything and some of the braves, and he's down on the ground because he's fall for his horse. He only has the one leg. He's like, you know me. I counsel peace. They took him down, and he went with the rest of those guys. Here's an interesting aspect to that. Subsequent to that particular fight, the word goes out that this massacre occurred. California sends in 1,000 militiamen. They go up into the... Um, Pyramid Lake area, the Indians see they're overwhelmed now at this point, and they race out into the Black Rock Desert. There's just a few skirmishes. There's a couple killed on either side. And then ultimately what's going to happen is we're going to make Pyramid Lake into an Indian reservation for the Paiute, which is what it is today. And that effectively ends 9,000 years of being in control of their own destiny and be able to migrate and follow their whatever animals and water supplies that they needed. And that was the big game changer. And this happens in 1860 here in our neighborhood, whereas we're not going to have any, you know, the main battles that you, most people are familiar with when the Westerns and everything are in the 1860s and 1870s. And you got Geronimo and all these very, and you know, the Cheyenne Indians and all of that kind of stuff. So this was quick and done, game over for the Indians. This gentleman here, uh, John Thompson, we call him Snowshoe Thompson because he's really California's first skier. This guy was really, really good at it. Uh, you don't think much of skiing in the 19th century, and they had long skis and pushed themselves along with one pole. It wasn't any of this dynamic stuff. But ultimately, Thompson gets himself into a situation, he lives in California, where he delivers mail in the winter months over the Sierra down into western Nevada. He does that route from Placerville over to Genoa, Nevada for about three years. He bails on that. He starts going to other places. 
and ultimately he puts 20 years in delivering mail, medicine, newspapers, uh, all different kinds of things. It's kind of like the UPS guy for the winter months for these uh, outlying uh, communities. And ultimately, if you think about this, one twisted knee, one broken ankle, the guy's by himself, game over. But he puts in 20 years and he survives all that. He's at Pyramid Lake because he's in Alpine County militia and he probably felt obligated to join. So he's there. His horse gets shot out from underneath him during this crazy retreat that they're in. And now he's just running on his feet. He's running as fast as he can trying to get out of there and figures this is it. And he feels something on his elbow and he figures now he's going to have a fight with some uh, warriors right here. He turns around and it's a riderless horse with the bridle and the saddle and everything on it. He jumps on and races away. He says, that horse saved my life. It was heaven sent because without it, he was done. And he says, that time was the only other time that I was afraid. There was one other time when I was delivering the mail over the Sierra at South Lake Tahoe. I was going through the snow and I come around a curve behind, around these big rocks and there's about 20 hungry wolves standing right there near his trail because he always used the same trail as best he could and there was nothing he could do. He's got a hundred pound pack. He can't turn around. He's got the wolves right there and he just held his breath and just kept skiing right past them and the wolves just watched him until he was about 100, 200 yards away. Then they just started to howl. And he says the hair went up on the back of his neck, but that was the only other time besides the battle of Pyramid Lake. And then, of course, we're going to put, we've got the Pyramid Lake into, uh, reservation. And at the end of the Walker River, there was also a reservation that were put in, was put in. And then the, for the whole picture, for both Indian troubles and for Confederate issues in the Civil War, they built Fort Churchill on the Carson River. And they were just, you know, a couple, you know, few hours ride into Virginia City if there was ever going to be any kind of uh, Southern Confederate insurrection on the Comstock when this was a very big deal because that silver, which was helped funding the North's efforts to pay for all of their military uh, equipment and all those things, the silver from Nevada. We think about Lake Tahoe as being Lake Tahoe since the beginning. Well, when John Fremont, he called it Mountain Lake, that name didn't stick. The other guy, Charles Price, he called it Lake Bon Plan. Uh, that was, you know, for a French botanist. That doesn't stick. And ultimately, people start hearing this word Tahoe, Tahoe, from the Washoe Indians. It really was, it's Da'ao, it's D-A, and then O-W, and that meant big water, deep water. Uh, but the thing is, phonetically, it sounded like Tahoe. And that was the name that people started to use, coming from the local Indian tribe. Well, anyway, in the 1850s, you have Governor Bigler here. He is one of California's first elected uh, governors. He ends up saying, well, you know, people are talking about that lake being officially called Tahoe, but what do you guys think? And he's talking to his, his political cronies and everything, and they're like, well, I don't know, John. Remember in, a few years ago when we went up there to, to that, up to that lake at the south end of the lake and we rescued those people? Because, yes, some people, families were trapped in their wagons when early snow hit, and they went up, they pulled everybody out. It's not that big of a deal. But they said, we should name that lake for you because you're now the governor and you've done that thing in the mountains and you're the guy. And he's like, yeah, well, that's, that sounds good. And all the legislature was all like, this sounds fine for us. We're going to name it for you. And uh, so they did pass that against everybody else in California was completely against it. They said, no, we like the name Tahoe, but just like today, do they listen? Of course not. They do what they need to do. And um, then Bigler comes out at the end of his governorship. He comes out as a Southern sympathizer. He's pro-Confederate, pro-slavery, which really pulls him out of any kind of sensibility of favoritism for the uh, people of Northern California. And ultimately, like, now we really got to change that name back. It takes all the way till 1945 for California to be able to figure that out. So whenever you see diaries from the 1860s, 70s, 80s, and 1900, you're going to see both on maps, it'll say Lake Bigler and Lake Tahoe, and people will write Bigler or Tahoe depending on their preference. But ultimately today, we do have it as Lake Tahoe, which makes sense because that's the name from the indigenous people. It didn't work out for um, Sam Clemens or Mark Twain, as we say. And I think I had something in that last piece where Mark Twain didn't like Bigler. Mark Twain fought for the Confederate, or Sam Clemens, before he came out and became Mark Twain in Virginia City, fought briefly for the Confederate side, coming from Missouri, Missouri kid briefly realized that this is really dangerous, and that's when he came out to Nevada Territory with his older brother, Orion, who is the 
first, he's the secretary for the first territorial governor of the new territory of Nevada. That's how Sam Clement gets out here, starts his writing, becomes Mark Twain. He didn't like the word Tahoe. He doesn't like Bigler, but he doesn't like Tahoe. But he's the guy who says that word means grasshopper soup. And if you look at Lake Tahoe, it's got stellar looks with the color of the water and everything else, the blue and the shades of it and everything. Grasshopper soup, never seen it. I'm assuming it's lumpy and green which is the antithesis of what Lake Tahoe looks like. So he's just trying to disparage the word. Anyway, we had this effort over the last few years to name a, uh, a cove on the east shore of Lake Tahoe Clemens Cove, because we have Mark Twain has written about this, his first views of Lake Tahoe in his, in his novel, uh, Roughing It. He has a lot of different stories about it. He compared every lake that he saw for the rest of his life in his world travels all against what Lake Tahoe looked like. He always thought it was still the most beautiful lake he had ever seen. And ultimately, they're trying to put at least one name of recognition for either Sam Clemens or Mark Twain in the Tahoe Basin. They bring this up in a meeting with the Nevada Board of Geographic Names, and the pitch was made, and the board is like, well, that sounds good. There's no name on this cove. We think it might work, and that's when the leaders of the Washoe tribe stand up at this meeting and they say, I don't care what you call that guy, Clemens or Twain or whatever he is to you, uh, he in his early writings described us as Digger Indians. Now, a lot of people called the Paiute and Washoe Digger Indians because they would dig for rodents, a staple of their diet, and they would dig for the roots of plants. Uh, the Indians at Pyramid Lake, the Paiute, they, the Washoe called them fish eaters. There's other tribes, they called them, you, you know, it was a, just a, a very descriptive way of talking about a tribe. And T Mark Twain wasn't the only guy to ever say digger, but to, in today's world, the Washoe considered that extreme racism, and despite that this happened a hundred and some years ago, they judge him on it, and they said, we are against any name after that guy in Tahoe and the Board of Geographic Names says, we agree with you, it'll never happen. Now, I'm going to stand here, I know I'm politically incorrect for saying it, but I completely disagree with that uh, particularly, particular decision. And shortly after that rejection, this was an editorial cartoon in the uh, Incline Village newspaper, and you see the name Clemens Cove going up in smoke. And it's interesting in a sense because one of the other things that people like to blame Mark Twain for when he came up to the lake with a buddy and they thought that they were going to start a timber claim, it turned out to be way too hard of work for, him, for Mark Twain to do. He was always adverse to vigorous work. Um, they ended up letting their cooking fire get caught up into the pine needles and it burned up the side of the mountain. They had to get into the rowboat to go out for safety and watch it. And of course, everybody wants to vilify him for that. But the fact is, accidents happen even today. Uh, but Suffice it to say, Mark Twain and his history and his relationship with Lake Tahoe in the literature will always be there. We just won't have anything topographical features in honor of him. And just around the same time, 1862, this is another thing that brought a lot of settlers up into, very briefly, up into the Truckee Tahoe area, was a gold strike. Well, people thought it was a gold strike right outside of the mouth of Squaw Valley and over by Martis Valley where the Truckee Airport is today. And uh, we had several thousand guys come up, and by 18 months later, I mean, they're digging and they're gathering all this ore specimens and all this stuff, and it wasn't until like the following year that somebody actually took it over into California, had it chemically tested and assayed, and the chemist is like, well, I don't even know if there's any gold at all in here, and if there is, it's certainly not going to be economically viable to worth after the processing and everything. So that whole thing turned out to be a bust. And this is a, one of the uh, small cabins that remained up until the 20th century of this uh, one town named Knoxville. But ultimately, we have four miners out of all these other guys, because most of these guys all run off into Nevada for the Reese River excitement. There was more gold being discovered in other places, and these guys are just running to wherever it was. So everybody abandons the Tahoe area, except for four particular guys, Burton, McKinney, Ward, and Blackwood. Their names are on four major canyons there in the North Shore and the west side of the lake, and they become the first people to permanently settle at the Tahoe City and North Tahoe area. Yes, the Indians have been coming up for almost 10,000 years, but only for summer. 
these guys decide to stay in the game year round and make a life for themselves, which they do. And it's that year of 1863 that you start seeing Taha City being built up. And ultimately, that is the year we considered the founding of Taha City. So in 2013, it was a 150 year birthday. Looking down at the Emerald Bay area at the south end of the lake, you can see how, they were, how it was formed. Uh, you can't see, I'll just explain it necessarily. Uh, glaciers came out of the high mountains here, carved their way down. Glaciers carved, 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 pushing, pushing, pushing. For whatever reason, this piece of rock there was so obdurate, so resistant to the ice, the ice cleaved around it and just kept on going. And the nose of the um, surge punched through the moraine, the, the, all the debris that it's pushing in front of it on either side, punched through and makes Emerald Bay. And right over here, we call this Cascade Lake. Same thing happened. Glaciers came down, scoured it out, pushed up all the debris and everything in front of it, and then whatever happened, the climate changed. There wasn't enough ice, I'm not sure. But ultimately, it stopped there before it retreated back and left the lake, as opposed to punching in and making another bay. Well, it turns out this slide just happened on Christmas Day of 1955. That's a weather-related situation. But what happens here in the early 1860s is Ben Holliday is a stagecoach magnet. He's got a stagecoach, California Express. It runs from Colorado all the way into California through the Placerville route. And that means you're going to go through the south end of Lake Tahoe. Well, Holliday's got his whole route going and everything. He comes in. He sees Emerald Bay. There's nothing there. So he just preempts the land and takes ownership of, of uh, Emerald Bay. And ultimately, he says, well, he builds a house there and everything. He needs someone to caretake the house in the winter months to keep the snow off the roof and just to watch over it. So he hires this guy, uh, uh, Dick Barter. B Barter is a uh, retired British Navy uh, man, officer. And he had come to the United States. And he's the perfect candidate for a couple reasons. One, he doesn't mind living by himself for months at a time, because it's a very isolated, secluded area. And two, he's perfect because he's really good at sailing. And he's good with getting over along the water. And that's what you're going to need if you're going to be at Emerald Bay in the wintertime, because when the snow is 10 or 12 feet deep, you're not going anywhere and no one's coming in. So if you want to get out, you row out of the mouth of the bay, and then you can row the 14 miles up to Tahoe City and hit the saloons, get some supplies, whatever you need to do. And that's exactly what he would do. He'd get, start getting stir crazy, cabin fever, what have you. He'd row his boat up to the saloon in Tahoe City, start throwing back the beers and the shots and telling stories of his old days in the Navy. And then it'd you know, get to be 10 o'clock. He's like, well, I got to get out of here because I got to row back down to Emerald Bay. So he got into his rowboat in January of 1870. He's rowing, rowing, and a big wind comes in and blows him the, the boat over. He falls in the lake. He's completely soaked. It's January, so pretty cold. He eventually gets the rowboat flipped over again, and he crawls into it. But he's freezing, and he knows he's not going to make it unless he gets back to his house in a timely manner. So he rows furiously for hours and hours, saying, I'll never surrender. I'll never surrender. And he pulls into Emerald Bay, he falls out of the boat, and he climbs up through the snow, and he gets into his house, he falls into bed, and he lives. Well, nobody really knows this happens. And during the course of this whole thing, he does suffer frostbite in parts of his body, and his feet were beat up pretty bad. He, had, he couldn't walk, so he tied pillows to his knees, and he shuffled around on his knees. And that's what he did for a couple of months. And during that time, of course, he's, gone, he's bored, uh, so he assembles from scratch, carves all the wood himself, this man of war six foot model, scale model. It had 120 personnel on board, crewmen. They were all uh, carved out of single pieces of wood in their uniforms. He painted them all. He had the sails rigged up and everything. And when summer came, he was feeling better. He was able to gimp around a little bit. And he decided, that rowboat that I was in, that little dory, that was way too small. This lake's huge. I need a bigger boat. And he ends up constructing an 8,000 pound sailboat. And he does it all by himself. And the way we find out about this is a San Francisco Chronicle reporter comes into Truckee by train. And he's like, you know, he's just interviewing people. He's looking for stories and some cool things for the people in the city to read. And he gets to Tahoe City, and he's like, you know, anybody, real characters that I could talk to? And they're like, oh, you should go see the Hermit of Emerald Bay. That guy's a character. Make sure you bring him a bottle of whiskey, otherwise he won't let you in. 
So the guy rides his horse down to Emerald Bay, bangs on the door, and Barter opens up. What do you want? You know, I got some whiskey. I just wanted to ask you a couple questions. Come on in. You know, and he tells him the story I just told you. Oh, yeah, last year was a bummer, man. I fell off the rowboat in the winter, then I, but I, then I made my little scale model, kept me busy. Then I put that boat out there and everything. And the reporter's like, well, I mean, I can see you're the, you're the industry. I can say that boat is brand new. I can tell you just built that this summer. And, uh, you know, I see the scale model, the warship you did. They were all, it's very cool. And he says, but I really have a hard time believing that you actually fell into the water in the dead of winter and were able to survive that. And Barter limps over to his dresser drawers and he pulls out a jewelry box. He gives it to the reporter. He says, well, open it up. And the reporter opens up the box and inside are Captain, about five of Captain Barter's toes that he had cut off because of frostbite. That's not even the weird part. The weird part was he had salted them to preserve them as mementos to show people who didn't believe the story. Anyway, he, this guy, because it's not his house, right? He's a caretaker. Well, he's feeling a little older, and he's feeling like, you know what? I can't just die in my boss's house. That wouldn't be right. So one day, he rows out to the island, and he uh, assembles a coffin. He builds a coffin for himself, and he builds this little chapel. And he has the coffin in there, and his idea is, when I'm ready to die, I'm going to row out to the island, I'm going to crawl into my coffin, I'm going to shut the lid, and I'll be done with it. Well, everybody wants to control their lives like that, but that's not what's going to happen for him. He ends up going to a saloon at South Lake Tahoe, Rowland's saloon, and he's coming back in his nice new 8,000-pound boat. The winds come up and dump him over, and he drowns in 1,000 feet of water. So he never made it into uh, his coffin. And if you do go to Emerald Bay, you will see a little castle kind of a thing on top. It's not this. Uh, this has been long gone. That is from a woman named uh, Laura Knight, who was a wealthy heiress who ended up putting a tea house on that uh, island there. If I had come back, I have got a ton of stories about them too, but so, um, this is just, I cherry picked these for today. Uh, you know, so by 1869, we've got a transcontinental railroad that's running fine. We also have, uh, it, in, by 1870s, it's connected to the Virginia and Truckee Railroad, which services all of the Comstock, Reno and Carson, Carson City and Virginia City and all that. But in, other than those two mechanical setups, everything else is going to be done by stage throughout all the gold rush country and up and over the Sierra and this, that, and the other. And uh, so you're going to have a lot of commercial stagecoach operations. Well. There was also going to be a lot of road agents out there and bandits who not only wanted to rob the people on the stages of their purses and their wallets and whatever valuables they had, their watches and jewelry, but also Wells Fargo would often ship payroll, uh, gold coins for banks, different things like that, and that's what a lot of these guys were going after, was the money box. Well, we have this guy, Charlie Parkhurst, who's a pretty famous driver of the day, and this gang led by a guy named Sugarfoot. And what they would do, they'd wait till the stage is coming up a very steep grade or going around a tight curve when they're going really slow. And what you do is you just jump out from a hidden spot, you grab the lead horse's bridle, and you hold them, and, and game over. You're just stuck there, and now you got your guns out, and everybody's going to put their hands up. Well, these guys try to pull this stunt on Parkhurst, and he, quick as a whip, he snaps his whip at the horses, they jump forward like this, they knock the guys out of the way, and the stage takes off, and Parkhurst turns around, they're shooting at the stage, he turns around, he empties his six shot, and it turns out that he hits the leader, uh, Sugarfoot, in the abdomen, who dies three days later. So Wells Fargo was extremely happy, the, the passengers were not hurt, the money box was not stolen, they gave, um, and this was a typical thing for a very heroic act, Wells Fargo would give you a custom-made gold watch, big and heavy, solid gold, gold chains, and on it with the back would be inscribed your feat of heroism and the date that occurred. So Parkhurst gets one of these, and there's another time he's coming down a steep grade, and the horse, you know, that eight horses, six, eight horses, he's having a hard time hull, pulling them back, and it, the, the stage is going a little bit faster and faster, and then it hits this rock, and the stage pops up like this, and Parkhurst is thrown off the bench from where the driver is. He's thrown off. Now, the first thing you want to do is hit the ground and roll away from the wheels and protect yourself. Parkhurst doesn't do that. He still maintains his hold on the reins, is thrown off the bench, he's dragged on his stomach, and he finally brings the horses to a stop, which keeps it from being a runaway and going over a cliff and killing all the passengers. Another very big deal. 
Ultimately, he ends up dying in 1879. The doctor's preparing the body for burial, and he comes out to tell all uh, Parkhurst buddies, you know, that guy Charlie was actually a woman, and her name was Charlotte. She had come from the East Coast as an orphan. At some way, she just real she loved horses. She had worked with horses in a stable back east in New England, and she wanted to be free and control her destiny, but being a single woman, and particularly if you weren't, every a woman generally was on the marry, had to be with a man. She didn't want that, and ultimately she discarded all of her female attire and took on man, men's outfits, right, and everything. She always had a hat pulled down high, uh, tight on her head. She smoked cigars, chewed tobacco, she drank, she cursed, she fought, you name it, she was just like one of the boys, right? And nobody had any idea this was going on. And even Hank Monk, he's the most famous of all the drivers out of uh, Carson City. He would take uh, people up to Lake Tahoe and go around the lake and tell them all kinds of crazy stories. And he had spent four and five nights together with Parkhurst. You know, they just roll out on, the, uh, on their, their um, bed rolls and stuff during the course of long trips and things like that. And he was blown away. It was the first time he didn't have anything to say. He just couldn't understand it, how that Charlie could have actually been a woman and him not know it. And ultimately, One-Eyed Charlie, they called her that because uh, when she was shoeing a horse, the horse had kicked her, she lost an eye, and she wore an eye patch over that. So as time went on, she probably didn't look like your typical woman as things were moving forward. But she was the first woman to vote in the United States in 1868, dressed as a man. So there you go. And up at Lake Tahoe, we have the big Comstock production. We need a lot of logs to support the mines going down. You need the core wood to fire up the boilers and everything. And all the wood's going to be coming out of the Tahoe Basin and the uh, nearby Sierra. Where there was no water sources, they would just peg in uh, a cord out half logs and then grease it. And then you throw the logs in there, they would come flying down with smoke and flames and, and sparks and all that kind of a thing. But in general, they would try to divert water into the flumes. And this was, once it was built, and they built these babies really fast, once it was built, these logs would come flying down and everything would be very cheap and quick to get it out of the mountains in a way that otherwise oxen would have to drag them out of the woods. And there was this great story about this uh, reporter from New York Tribune, this guy Ramsdell comes out, and he asks one of the millionaires about the flume operation. He says, well, you know what? You know, we ever, you ever want to try to take a ride in one of these flumes? And he's like, you crazy? And he, got, and he figures, well, if this guy's a multimillionaire and I'm just a reporter, it can't be that dangerous. Well, it ends up they jump in. Uh, four men in two of these little boats go flying down, flying down. The two boats smash into each other. They break into smithereens. And the men just with all the wood, broken up wood, and the men's uh, bodies come flying down like this. And all of them live. They just couldn't get out of bed for a week because they were so beat up. And one of the things, this is an artist's rendition. You see the lumberjack on the log. But the fact is, by the time anything was put into a flume, a water flume, it was already cut into lumber, generally cut on site or floated across the lake to one of the big mills, cut there, and then sent down. And here is the yard, the wood yard, at the bottom near Carson City coming out of the Lake Tahoe area. And you can see all this lumber that had been cut up. And this is, helps get you the idea of how devastated the Tahoe Basin was because of this um, need for it in the uh, Comstock. And then the Virginia Truckee Railroad was really the key to bringing a whole industrialization up because the V&T Railroad would be up by the mines. It would get all the ore that was being extracted from the bowels of the earth put on the cars. The cars would take it down to the Carson River where the water wheels would power the stamps that crushed the ore to extract the silver and the gold. Now these empty V&T cars would then continue on to Carson City, pick up all the wood, bring that back up to the Comstock mining operations, unload the wood, take the ore, bam, bam, bam. And that was the triangle that made it happen. Otherwise, before that was all being done by draft animals. It was very expensive and very uh, time consuming. Uh, this guy Baldwin came into town in the 1870s, and he had done pretty well down in San Francisco. He's building hotels. A lot of his stuff was destroyed in the 1906 quake and fire. But he's got these different things going down in the city. But he came up to Lake Tahoe, and he saw that there was only a few places left that had been protected from the logging operation. These were pieces of private property. He ends up buying one of these properties, and it was just south of where Emerald Bay is. 
And ultimately, he does, you know, he's limited on his cash at the moment, so he's not sure what he can do. But he hears from some guys that he meets in San Francisco, these British guys, they're going to India for some big game hunting. It was going to last about nine months, this trip. And they said, you want to go? And Baldwin's like, yeah, that sounds great. I'll definitely do it. Well, he's heavily invested in the Hal and Norcross mine in Virginia City. And these stock valuations are going up and down, up and down all the time. It's a real roller coaster ride. And Baldwin had bought a lot of stock. He was slowly losing money because ha the miners hadn't really come upon any really decent loads for a while now, and the stock's on a slow slide. He's still ahead of the game, but it's slowly going down. Well, he tells his lawyer before he leaves for the hunting trip, he says, listen, I'm going to be out of here for almost a year. Watch that stock. If you see it continue to slide down, and when it hits this number, sell it off. Because I'm, not, I'm going to, willing to lose a little, but I'm not going to take a bath on this stock. And the lawyer says, I got it. That's cool. Well, Baldwin's gone. He's, still com he's coming back like in six weeks, and the stock is still on a very slow slide. It finally hits that key number, the trigger number, and the lawyer's like, oh, time to dump it. Um, goes to the safe, doesn't have the combo. Can't open the safe. He's like, ah, oh, this is going to be a nightmare. When Baldwin shows up, and uh, four weeks later, when Baldwin shows up, in that four weeks, the miners had struck the mother load in that mine, and the stock price went through the roof. He made millions of dollars. And that's why they call him Lucky Baldwin as one of the reasons. And that helps him finance his property up at Lake Tahoe. He ends up building the Talak Hotel, this beautiful, super expensive. This wasn't for the average person at all. This was for the elite people from San Francisco and or New York if you wanted to come out. And the interesting thing about it was most times when you're going to build something like this in the forest, all the trees nearby are all going to be used in the construction process, right? Well, he didn't want that. He still wanted the big trees around the hotel. So he established a sawmill about three miles away at Fallen Leaf Lake, did all the logging there, brought all the wood in, and built the hotel with the original forest that he purchased the land for the old growth that was around it, not because everything else had been pretty much clear cut. Anyway, Baldwin had some issues, particularly with women. Been married five times. We don't even know how many affairs he had and how many legitimate children and everything else. Um, <clears throat> he hires his cousin Veronica to work for him. Then he tries to sexually assault him, uh, her. Uh, three days later, she gets away. Three days later, she comes back with a loaded gun. He's in, his, in the hotel in San Francisco with all these people around. She walks right up to him and tries to shoot him in the chest, and unfortunately she missed and hit him in the arm. Uh, he sends her to Denver to, for an insane asylum to get her out of the picture. This young lady here, Louise Perkins, she thinks he's going to marry her. She gets pregnant. He says, I don't know who you are anymore. And she tries to sue him for uh, legal money and everything else. And Baldwin is very cavalier about the whole thing. He says, listen. Everybody knows my reputation. All of these women have been warned before they come to me, or I talk to them. So it's not my fault. And that was his thing. He had a big funeral, they, but the journalist said no one shed a tear the day he died. And later that Talak Hotel was, was uh, destroyed about 1910, 1920. But there are still some original buildings there. This Talak historic site, which is south of, Lake, uh, south of Emerald Bay, is uh, virtually nobody goes there. You can go up to Tahoe in July and it's gridlock, it's ugly. But you can go to this Talak historic site, it's all free access, free parking, free beach and all this. You can take a dog to the beach and you just walk around and look at some of these old estates and such. It's very peaceful. It really is very nice. I take groups there uh, quite a bit. And this is what Tahoe looked like after all was said and done. Virtually clear cut except for a couple of private parcels of private property. You can get an acre of land in 1890s for $1.50, and that's the time to invest in Lake Tahoe. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> and it was this guy, Dwayne Bliss, who ended up being one of the principal timber barons. He made a boatload of money cutting down all the trees. So everybody's looking around, it's all trashed, and he says, you know what, but when these trees go back, grow back, this place is going to look pretty good again, you know? So maybe I can move forward and get into the tourism business, and it'll only take about 20 years for this forest to grow back, was his, was his idea. First thing he did in the 1890s, he has a metal fabrication plant in San Francisco, 
put together this steamer Tahoe. There had been steamers on the lake before, mostly for pulling barges, for pulling rafts of logs and things of that nature. This was made strictly for passengers to go in comfort. And it looks, it's a very sharp looking boat, there's no doubt about it. So he puts that out on the lake, and then the next thing he does is starts to build this Tahoe Tavern Hotel. It's a beautiful modern hotel right outside of Tower City with all the latest amenities, bowling alleys, and you name it, everything you could possibly want. And the key part was we had had, there had been like five small little logging railroad operations, these little short lines at various points around the lake. It was an inexpensive way to get all the wood over for, to the mills and then eventually up to get them into the flumes too, above on the ridge line. Well, once all the trees are gone, all this stuff's now pretty much abandoned. It has no value. So for pennies on the dollar, he buys all these locomotives and all the track and all these buildings, and he rafts everything from various points of the lake up to Tahoe City. And he has his son, uh, he one of his sons who had just graduated from what becomes MIT. He has him lay out a short line between Tahoe City and Truckee, and Truckee is on the main transcontinental railroad. These passenger cars, which of course wouldn't have been coming from any logging operations, were picked up from an operation out of Santa Cruz because they were converting a narrow gauge to standard, and uh, he was able to get them on the cheap also. But even though he wanted to bring in lots of tourists, it's still early in the game. And what he ended up doing is having a spur built from the hotel area, one a little bit further south and into the first canyon, Ward Canyon, and then also a spur built into Squaw Valley where the Olympics were held later. And they were taking all the trees out of there. And these would be raw logs that would then be stacked on flatbeds and taken up to the mills in Truckee, where they would then be cut into lumber and sold. So that was the way he kept the finances going in the manner of trying to build up the tourism moving forward. And it did pick up steam in the 1920s and 30s. This was a really big deal. It was very popular. The train itself, if you didn't get off at the Tahoe Tavern and stay there, there was other places starting to be built around the lake. The train itself would go out on a 900-foot long pier and park, and then the steamer would come up, and you step off the train onto the steamer, and then off you go. And you go around the lake or stop, whatever you wanted to do. And this becomes the whole setup where instead of a stagecoach ride from Truckee into Tahoe City, Everything's just being done in all the comfort of the modern conveyances of the time. And here's a postcard shot of what this narrow gauge looked like coming along the Truckee River. And today, that was all abandoned around World War II. And the roadway was, the right of way was uh, given to the state, converted it to Highway 89, which is right here. But parts of the original right of way are still here, and they ended up paving it and making it into bike trails and such. And you can go along the river and enjoy yourself without having to deal with cars right next to you, which is, I think, is the biggest bummer. I mean, Todd is a great place to ride a bike, but you're always sharing it with cars. And that takes away from this relaxation, in my opinion, anyway. I've got two more stories. Here's Captain George Wattell. He wasn't really a captain. He comes from a very, very wealthy San Francisco family. And in World War I, his father decided, well, this kid, I raised him with a silver spoon in his mouth. I gave him every opportunity. I sent him to college, dropped out. Another college, dropped out. Then he runs away. He goes off, runs off with the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. He's, tr he's training the animals. He's, he's marrying these floozies. We gotta pay them off. We have to get lawyers and stuff. This kid's a nightmare. But he needed the kid to show some kind of sense of social responsibility. So in World War I, he, he sends him, I don't know how he does this, but he sends the kid to Italy where he is made a captain as an ambulance driver, way behind the front line. So he had a very easy thing, but then he comes back and he's always called captain for that ever since then. And it has nothing to do with being on the water. Anyway, the thing is, his parents give him about, first his dad dies, and then his mom's older, and ultimately they give him about $10 million play money, you know, part of his inheritance. <clears throat> he takes that money and he, in the roaring 20s, he jacks that up on the stock market to $50 million, and four months before the big crash, walks away, takes everything out. Some say he helped precipitate the crash by taking that much money out of the San Francisco Stock Exchange. But ultimately, he now has $50 million cash, and it's the first thing you want to do is move to Nevada, where it's going to be somewhat protected from the tax man, right? So he comes up to Lake Tahoe, and he's going to end up, and this is Dwayne Bliss has now passed on, but it's 
in, uh, his kids own, still own the company that owns lots of these tracts of land of this, far, uh, this um, stuff that had all been cut. And ultimately, Wattel comes, and for just two of the $50 million, he buys all of this part of Lake Tahoe, from what the state line is on the North Shore all the way down to nearly south end of the lake. It's over 20-some miles worth of, of a shoreline, and up to the ridge. So he owned the whole thing like that. And ultimately, he is going to want to put stuff in there. I mean, it's all his private property. So the first thing he does is in the late 30s, he builds this uh, Thunderbird Lodge. And it's a very quirky place. It's really very interesting. They do tours and such like that. He brought in all kinds of artisans from all around, including the stonemasons from uh, Carson City, from the uh, Paiute and Washoe Indian tribes. He was a philanderer. He always was playing around and stuff. And he finally did find a woman who was willing to marry him. She was a French debutante, so she was kind of of his same social station. Uh, but she didn't want to be around him very much at all. So when he was in Tahoe, she was down in their estate in the Bay Area or back in France. Frequently, she was out of the country. And they never had kids. But obviously, she liked animals just like uh, George Wattell does, because that's what happens. George Wattell starts hosting parties at his Thunderbird Lodge, and he brings up his pet lion, Bill. He flies in his uh, dingo, his baby elephant. He's got all this stuff going on in this private property on the, on the East Shore. Well, he never wanted to see his help. So you have the house up here, and then you have the pantry and the kitchen, and everything is downstairs. Now, this is the modern era. We're talking World War II and after that even. So when your help will drive the car to go get groceries and stuff, right, and come back, well, you can't just pull up and walk into the house. They have to pull up to this door that was very low on the parking lot area, and there was a very long tunnel, a 700-foot-long tunnel that they had carved through underneath the house. And they put these tracks in, and these were little ore carts. So they would take the bread and the groceries and ketchup and put it in these ore carts and then push it along in the tunnel that would lead you to the pantry. And so that was, that's still all there. And uh, this was supposed to be his boathouse. And I'll show next slide I think is his boat. It's way too big to fit into this little berth. Ultimately, so he has it sealed off. It, it's looking right at the lake. If you look, you could jump out that window and be right, on the, right in the water. So it's right on the lake, but he says, you know what, let's make it into an indoor swimming pool instead. And it just so happened that while that construction was being done, because I was on the tour a couple years ago, this is exactly what it looks like. You look in this room, and it, it's like, what happened? This room's not finished. Well, the story is that one of the workmen who was in there that day was on this ladder. The ladder slips. He falls, dies of complications from his injuries, and Wattel says that room is cursed. I don't want anybody in there. I don't want anything. I want it sealed off. And the door was sealed and locked, and now the door is open, but everything that is in it is exactly to the same minute that that guy fell off of that ladder and then later died. Ultimately, he was a really big-time gambler, and he would have big shots and high rollers come over to his estate for games and such. Ty Cobb, the famous baseball great, had a house just down in Zephyr Cove, just outside of uh, Wattel's property line. Joe King, we have Kings Beach is named for him. He was a big time gambler. These guys were always playing for high stakes. And then I have that Tom O'Neill up there. That's my wife's dad. He was a world class diver out of the uh, Santa Clara Valley area, right, San Jose area, world-class diver, and in 1930s, they brought him up to this Brockway Hot Springs to do exhibition diving for the guests. Well, this is of the day, if you're a woman and you don't have an escort, you need a male escort to go to the nearby Cal Neva uh, Casino, which is just 100 yards away, but you would need a man to take it. Tom would escort some of the female guests to the casino, and he told me firsthand he was there, and he watched Wattel playing cards. They would put $10,000 a hand down like that. And this is during the Depression, where most people were barely scratching even at all. There is the Thunderbird uh, yacht that he had built, Wattel had built. This stainless steel superstructure was put on after it was purchased by Bill Hara of Hara's casino fame. The thing was, this had two Allison aircraft engines. This thing would go 70 miles an hour on Lake Tahoe, which is pretty tough at that elevation and everything. And during the war, during World War II, 
Wittell was so afraid that the government was going to come and steal his engines to put him in airplanes for the war effort, right? He had it hung in this boathouse, hung up, and kept it all covered. So nobody knew that this boat even existed. And then ultimately, he's going to sell it to Bill Harrow because he's not even using it anymore. And one of the things that happened, here's his pet lion, Bill. One of the things that happened, Wittell was messing with one of his lions or one of his elephants or whatever he was doing. The animal rolled over on him and broke one of his, his pelvis. And he refused to go to the hospital. He refused to get the required treatment for it. He says, I don't know, I don't need it. And after that, he was real gimpy and real, mostly relegated to a wheelchair. So he wasn't getting out on this boat anymore or doing anything else. But he would have these crazy parties where women would be dressed, uh, would be naked on ponies and riding around the place and stuff. And uh, the thing that they said, if you drank too much and passed out, they would lock you in a room with the lion, and that's how you would wake up, right next to the lion, uh, Bill. And there's this great shot of, of Wittell driving this, I don't know, Studebaker convertible. It's got like three sets of seats like this, and he's up in the front driving with his captain's hat, and you got the lion, Bill, in the last back seat like this with his mane blowing in the wind and everything else. It's uh, pretty funny. He had plans to put casino hotels at all these different beautiful beaches that are up there in the East Shore. But he didn't really, wasn't a big fan of the humans. He was like, you know, it's, they're OK sometimes. I really like my animals. And if I put up casinos here, it's going to be noise and people and traffic and everything. So he never did anything about it. And ultimately, the state of Nevada says, listen, man, you know, you look at California. They've got, you name it, California's got it. Um, so Tahoe is a nice part of California. But they've got a lot of other things, too, including that whole coastline, right? Well, Nevada? Not so much. Tahoe is really one of the only best jewels that they really have that's going to be really attracting people. And the state's looking at this guy, Wattel, and he's like, man, he has our whole portion. He owns it himself. So they start coming up to him, putting the word in his ear, like, hey, man, what do you think if we buy you out and we take this land, you know? He's like, oh, no, oh, no. And he starts to sell parts of it. He sells part of it to the Crystal Bay Development Company, who builds Incline Village. That was Wattel land that he just sold it off so the state couldn't get it, went all private and went straight up into development. Then he starts giving away land to different entities, the University of Nevada, the hospital down there. And then ultimately, he's getting on in his years, and he's really not getting around. And the state just came up and pulled an eminent domain, and they wrote him a check, a fair market value check for all of that land, and sent him on his way. Go back to your state down in the Bay Area. Thank you very much, George, for never developing this whole part of it. And now it all became uh, state parks. And here's the final story. I really love this. This is Myrtle Hoddleston. Now, this woman's just living in Illinois, raising her kid, husband's working and everything. When she's 30 years old, a friend says, you know, I'm going to the local lake. You want to go out for a swim? She's like, well, I've never been swimming before. Yeah, I'd love to do that. So they go to the lake. And she starts, they, she starts swimming around and stuff. She's like, yeah, this is fun. This is fun. Well, it was so much fun. And she got so good at it so fast. And two years later, she swam the Catalina Channel. It's, an open, it's a 20-mile open ocean swim, one of the first women to do it. Now she's got a coach and an entourage. She starts going on and setting all new records. I, she, they go to pools. She treads water for 70-some hours, like triple what the man had ever done. So she's doing all these different kinds of records. And ultimately, she hears about this thing up at Lake Tahoe. It's in 1930. We're going to, we're going to be in the, uh, in the uh, Depression. We don't have much business going on. And the Tahoe Tavern Hotel, that Bliss Hotel, is still there. And they said, we are going to offer a cash reward for the first person who can swim across Lake Tahoe. Had never been done. Swim from Nevada side to Tahoe City, where the hotel is. Well. Myrtle hears about it, and she says to her coach, she says, ah, what's that? You know, how far is that, 10 miles, 12 miles? Let's do it, man. We can use some money. So she comes up here and everything else. She goes over to the East Shore. This is at Sand Harbor, and she started a place down here, a point that, rocky point that sticks out called Dead Man's Point. She gets at 7 a.m. in the morning in August. She covers her skin with grease to protect her from the cold water. She dives in, and she's going to swim directly across the lake to the Tahoe Tavern Hotel. It's where her coach is waiting, her kid's waiting, everything else. So she dumps in the lake. She starts to swim. Well, it turns out, usually Tahoe gets windy later in the day, in the afternoon. It's water skiing in the morning when it's flat. It's sailing in the afternoon when it's windy. This was a windy day 
from sunrise on. So she starts to swim across. She's immediately blown off course. So instead of going across the lake, she's blown. She's got to go just trying to keep herself off of all the rocks and all these beaches and go around every little point and everything. She's swimming and swimming. The waves are hitting her, crashing over her and such. She has two motorized boats with her, two escort boats. It's not a suicide mission. And these guys are just there to help her. If she has to give up, she has to give up. They'll just pull her out and take her back to the hotel. Well, she's swimming and fighting the waves and everything else and it's going hour after hour after hour. And finally, the sun sets and it gets dark. Well, when the sun set, the energy of the atmosphere diminished and the winds abated and the, and the lake got calm. And at that point, she's like, oh, I'm breaking out my crawl now. So she starts the Australian crawl and she swims away from her escort boats. The only job description these two guys had was to stay with the swimmer and help her if she needs it. Well, it's after midnight and they're like, Myrtle, Myrtle, where are you? They get no, no nothing comes back. So they're like, you know what? We're not going to find her out here tonight. Let's go back to the hotel and we'll get her in the morning. And that's what they do. And they show up and everybody's like, what happened to Myrtle? Our coach is still waiting. You know, I would, well, she, I don't know. We'll get her tomorrow's first light. So come sunrise, you got about 10 different motorboats go shooting out into the lake, all spreading out. And one of the boats comes upon her. Fortunately, she's just sitting there treading water. She can't move at all. I mean, she's just like, I am so weak. I'm sick. I'm starving. I haven't eaten in 24 hours. I got muscle cramps. Pull me out. Who's on the boat? Her 15-year-old son. He says, Mom, you're only a mile or two from the hotel. I can hear them cheering for you now. So he's like, well, get out of my way. She starts to swim again. She finally gets to the beach, and she crawls out. And they have a gurney there with an ambulance and everything. She crawls up. She gets her $700 cash, which is worth $11,000 today. It only took her about 23 hours to make that swim three hours longer than it took to go across the Catalina Channel. So, and she becomes the first person to swim across Lake Tahoe, and that was a really big deal. And now, we've got guys coming up there. The, the width is a maximum of 12 miles. The length is 22. So we don't know how far she swam. She swam a lot more than 12 miles because of all that. Now you have guys going from the north end to the south end, the south end to the north end, north end back to the south end, all in one day. So. Just like everything out there, it's all extreme, crazy sports anymore. But uh, anyway, that's it for me. Quick commercial and stuff. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Thank you so much, Mark. I'm sure we all enjoyed that. Uh, we're going to have to keep our questions shorter than usual because it's getting late. So just raise your hand if you have a question for Mark, and I'll try to get on my roller skates and get to everybody. As usual, I talk too long. <laughs> That's a Philadelphia thing. I understand. <laughs> yes, uh, I've heard that the tw uh, top 12 feet of Donner Lake is owned by uh, the Native Americans uh, that own Pyramid Lake, and that every fall, the top 12 feet of Donner Lake is drained into the Truckee River, so it ends up in the um, Pyramid Lake. And then, of course, with the snow melt every spring, that 12 feet is, is uh, replenished in Donner Lake. And I've also heard that it's a gentleman's agreement. There's no written documentation uh, for that agreement. It, it, could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, you've got some things mixed up there. Nevada does own the top 12 feet of Donner Lake, and it, it, the water is discharged at the end of the boating season. After Labor Day weekend, they'll slowly start draining it off. Um, it doesn't go to Pyramid Lake uh, per quota, as you might think, uh, but it is used in Nevada. The, what they ended up doing, and this is a, I have a whole presentation on water management issues on the Truckee Tahoe system. Um, what happened was in the late 1800s, there was a movement afoot to divert the water by putting a dam at where Squaw Valley is, divert the water out of the Truckee River, run a tunnel through the Sierra, and dump it on the west side and through pumping stations and canals to de deliver it to San Francisco. That gets shut down when the feds come in, eventually it goes to Hetch Hetchies where they get their water. But when the feds come in to mitigate this water war, because Nevada says, you're going to need an army to take that water. That is our water. California says, I don't know what you're talking about. Three-fifths of Tahoe is in, is in California. The outlet's in California. The diversion point is in California. And the feds came out and they said, 
due to prior appropriation in Western water law, it's the first in time, first in right. The first person to put, take water and put it to beneficial use, that's their water into perpetuity. And ultimately, Nevada wins that, and the top six feet of Tahoe is now allocated to Nevada. The Pyramid Lake Indians, they said, what happens to our water when all this stuff's going on? And what we ended up, they finally in the 1980s were able to make this happen in a court of law, and we built a large reservoir, part of the Stampede Boca Prosser system was built with water stored for Pyramid Lake during times of to protect the endangered kiwi fish or the um, uh, uh, trout spawning down there. So they have water allocated. But the 12 feet of Donner Lake, which is, you're exactly right, is discharged at, after the season, does not quid pro quo go to Pyramid Lake. And in fact, one last thing, I know I'm making a long thing here, check out how crazy this is. We have virtually no water going on in our system right now. But when this was all set up in the late, um, in the early 1900s, part of the beginning of the Desert Reclamation Act of putting water in the desert and bringing it to fruition for vegetation, we allocated a whole bunch of water to a place out by Fallon, Nevada, which is way east of Reno, five inches of rain a year, one of the driest places in the United States. We run water from the Truckee Tahoe system all the way out to Fallon, where they use that water to grow alfalfa, which they feed dairy cows, and they milk the cows, they take the milk, they dehydrate it, and they sell it to China. There you go. There you go. How crazy is that? <laughs> but so you were right, but a little bit more specifics in there. Anybody else? Any other questions? Excellent. Well, thank you, thank you so for coming. Much, Mark. My thank pleasure. You.